dead in my ear. She does a good job, doesn't she? Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Good to have you with us today. This bright sunny morning. I thought it was supposed to rain all day today and then they kind of changed the weather and just said it's going to be windy and uh, so these are the days that I have to carry a sandbag with me or I'll end up in the next county uh, and uh, but uh, praise the Lord for the beautiful weather. It's a little warmer out today. I was able to go out without the winter coat and the extra long johns and all those other things so praise the Lord for that. Good to have you that are with us here this morning and for those that are online 
uh, great to have you with us as well. Uh, a lot of folks, they you know sure what to do with the calendars uh, and the time and everything, so we're liable to get uh, people coming in and out at all different times. Oh, good morning, sir. Uh, so you never know what will happen. Uh, I woke up this morning and I set every clock in the house except for the one that I set for the alarm. <laughs> Yeah. The thing is, I didn't wait for the alarm to go off. I don't know that what triggered me, so I got up at four, <laughs> and I'm working away, thinking, "Man, this is, this is uh, something." Um, thinking it was five. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So, but anyway, uh, hopefully it's not the other way around. That's in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then everybody's waking up at ten and thinking it's nine and stuff. Yeah, yep. Well, I understand that it was uh, in Ohio, it was uh, uh, on the legislative docket, but uh, with COVID, it kind of got pushed to the back, and uh, maybe in another year or so, they'll they'll fix that. Uh, for a period of time, I lived uh, in an area right on the border of Ohio, Indiana, and we talked about it slow time, fast time, all the time. People would say, was that slow time or fast time? And I thought, oh my. Um, and uh, because they don't change. Well, anyway, we're glad that you're here, and uh, this is a great day, a uh, day for the Lord. Um, and we had a, a full week, this past week, a full week, a lot of things that happened, uh, we'll mention in the service later, but um, uh, absolutely a full week. And uh, this next week's going to be an interesting week, amen? Uh, I said, last night I said to the boys, I said, now, don't forget to pray for those folks that we have on our list, but also remember, got something really special happening on Tuesday, and they all three went and went, what? <laughs> and I said, if you don't know the answer to that question by now, oh, 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 the election, yeah, I said, yep, that's right. And uh, so we're praying that uh, God's will be done. I think uh, um, I was a recipient of a, um, of a letter in the mail about a month ago from someone that used to go to church, no longer does, and uh, they get um, the printed uh, information from us still, <clears throat> and they wrote me a, a long letter, kind of um, letting me know that they felt like some of the things that were in our literature were politically based, and that uh, their assertion was that politics and the church shouldn't ever uh, mix. And uh, so I think they were being genuine and honest. They weren't trying to pick a fight or anything. Um, the main issue that they had was over a statement regarding the GOP that was made on a prayer list. And of course that would be Republican. And so they obviously were not on that side of the ledger. And so it made them a little upset and uh, they wanted to voice their concern. And I, I wrote back to them just to say, you know, one of the things that's characterized the church through the ages has been that it has been politically activist. And not politically activist to a party, but politically activist to principles. And that's what's so important, is we have, uh, over the years, kind of lost that distinction and replaced it with the distinction of whether you're blue or red. Is that correct? I'm colorblind. I can't remember which ones. Uh, uh, which one that you're on. And uh, for the Christian, uh, people often ask me how they should vote, and I say, that's a personal choice. Uh, I have an opinion, but you're asking me as a pastor, and I just feel like that's not something I should do. But I will say this, I would never vote, regardless of party, if they went against the principles of God's Word. Now, sometimes it is you have to take the ones that's the least <laughs> of, the, of the bad, you know. But I, it's just hard for me to um, uh, vote for someone that disagrees with the very principles of God's Word. And so uh, through the ages uh, uh, of our great, king, uh, uh, our great uh, nation, uh, we have seen the church become active, not in social gospel or in social issues, as much as in principled issues. And that's another thing that kind of got, um, uh, uh, they, they've blurred the lines on again. Today we hear about social justice. 
that means that someone has to establish what they think is justice first, and then they try to legislate what they think is justice. The Bible doesn't ever talk about social justice. It talks about freedom and God taking upon himself for you and I what was not just so that we could be the recipients of his goodness and his mercy. So the church has never been about social justice. The church has historically been about God's justice and the principles of justice. Even Jesus gave us this example. <clears throat> if you remember when he turned the money changers tables over, he did not say, you have made me a den of thieves. He said, you have made my father's house. He was always on the rights of others of God, not his own rights. And so the idea of social justice today, first of all, someone has to determine what they think is just, and then two, they have to uh, politic to make sure everybody else believes that. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is God's word's clear. And uh, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, all right? And where one of the great things that founded this great country was on that principle of liberty. And they said liberty and justice for all. Now, <clears throat> one could co question that about liberty and justice for all. Yesterday, I got the uh, last evening, I, you know, I was, because they don't have all this so social wokeness involved in it, I watched Ohio State, amen, play football. I was hoping that they wouldn't allow any of that stuff in there because I wouldn't be able to watch it either. But they, uh, uh, Ohio State played, and I thought to myself, why don't I have the skill and the ability of any one of those players? See, social justice always says that we should all be equal. But, well, the truth is, is Roy's taller than me, and I'm jealous. I wish I was taller than him. And uh, I'm trying to think of Keith something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but the, the thing is, is the difference between justice and fair or justice and same is where many people fail to draw the line. So this is not a class on social justice or on who to vote for, but this is a, a, a wonderful time of the year for us to focus on the principles that made America strong and great and be able to apply that when we cast our vote, whoever it is, this Tuesday. And we pray that God's will be done for our king, uh, kingdom, which we call the United States. I'm, I recall, uh, because that's where we're studying on the kingdom, if you remember, and uh, so as we segue into that, I, I imagine what it was like for the nation of Israel. God said that he always had uh, a remnant that did not bow. So there was a, a, a remnant of true followers of God, always. And Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, they were three of them, four of them total, that they did not bow. There were the prophets, they didn't bow. And yet they lived in a country that they loved and believed that God had established the nation of Israel and they watched it crumble around them. And how that must have felt, <clears throat> every once in a while I kind of feel that way in the United States of America. And I just think of um, <clears throat> the hypocrisy. On the game last night, all the commercials were about the traditional family values. It had the ideal Harriet and Ozzy, uh, it was Ozzy and Harriet, uh, 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 grouping a family and everything. And yet, when it comes to the agendas that we take, it is to destroy that. But when they want you to buy their product, they try to appeal to you on that family relationship, even though politically uh, the progressive group in America tries to destroy that. They call it the nuclear family. And so um, uh, I imagine what it would be like to live in Israel during that time just before uh, the uh, King Nebuchadnezzar came in and did his work. Um, and uh, America, we're sitting at the crossroads where we too a uh, remnant that believe in the Lord and believe in liberty and believe in the principles of God. 
uh, have at every election run the risk of seeing that which we love and feel is right destroyed and taken from us. I've often said we never appreciate anything as much as when it's taken from us. And um, so I pray that that's not the case. <clears throat> but uh, Tuesday is a great day, and if you're not, um, uh, not thinking about voting, go out and vote. All right? That's probably the most I should say about it before I get myself in trouble. All right. So we've been talking in our uh, lesson, and thanks for everybody joining with us today. It's good to see you out there. We have folks from India already with us and uh, other places around the globe. We thank, thank the Lord for you folks coming and being with us each day uh, that we have uh, broadcast. Uh, we've been talking about principles of the Bible that are very important for us if we are going to understand the Bible correctly. And even this last week, Brenda and I, my wife, we were talking about some things, and I said, you should be in the adult Sunday school class. She says, I can't. I'm with the youth. And I said, yeah, well, you need to go back and listen because some of the questions that she was asking were based the question was based on a lack of knowledge of the very principles that we're studying. And when I explained them to her, she went, oh, now I see. And so these principles are so important. One of them was the ethnic principle, Jew, Gentile, and Church of God. And uh, so we've talked about several of these principles, context, uh, typology uh, in the Bible. These are very important principles. And in the sermon today <clears throat> that we have in this series of 10 uh, sermons on the end times or of eschatology, I hope that you'll be able to see that I uh, uh, bring into uh, question uh, with one of the points, the proof is through typology. And you'll be able to see that as we go down through it. Hopefully you'll see that <clears throat> in the sermon to follow. And we use types an awful lot to understand the truth of a passage. And the same with context and with uh, uh, the ethnic principle and with uh, uh, these these other principles that we've talked about. Well, the last one that we talked about is the principle of, of uh, discrimination, and that sounds bad in the world that we live today, but it's, it's about discriminating things being the same when they are different. And this occurs a lot in what causes a lot of misunderstandings in the Bible in our world today is when we group things together that God intended to be separate, all right? And one of those things is this concept of kingdom, kingdom. Uh, we often group together the words in the Bible that have anything to do with kingdom as one rather than as it is correctly, two, all right? So we're going to look through that just to see that. We mentioned last week that the... Uh, uh, the goal of God from the very beginning of the earth was to establish a kingdom on this earth. I talked with someone this past week, and it's so hard for many of us who've been raised in different ways to even put our arms around it. But contrary to what we have maybe been taught, God's plan for you and me in this time during the church age is not what his plan was from Genesis 1, 1 following. So a lot of people get by with that, and they'll say, well, in the Old Testament, people looked forward to the cross, and in the New Testament, people look back to the cross, and they see Christ in it all, and that's how people in Genesis 1, beginning with Adam all the way down, connect with God is through Jesus Christ. And yet the Bible, uh, there isn't anywhere in the Bible that ever makes that statement. In fact, there are many statements that give us the other uh, option, and that is that the people that wrote the Old Testament for us had no clue what they were writing. Even remember the Ethiopian eunuch? He was reading in Isaiah, and he was reading about the prophetic work of what was going to happen to Jesus Christ. And when Philip joined him in his chariot, he said, Tell me, and I'm paraphrasing, tell me, is the prophet speaking of himself or someone else? Do you remember the Bible says that Philip began to do? He began to preach unto him Jesus from that place. So either, even the Ethiopian looking at Isaiah's writing didn't understand. Isaiah didn't write, uh, understand. Peter wrote to his uh, uh, followers 
in his uh, first letter, he said that they, the Old Testament writers were searching what time the Spirit of God when, was in them when he signified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should reveal. They just didn't understand it. Even John the Baptist said of Jesus as he was coming down to Jordan to be baptized, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But he had no idea what he was saying. I mean, he didn't understand it. So this concept that's been taught incorrectly that the Old Testament people look forward to the cross and the New Testament people look back to the cross is a concept that sounds very religious. But it isn't true. Because... Abraham did not understand that his son that he got ready to offer on Mount Moriah was a picture of Jesus Christ. Had no clue to that. All right, David had no idea that when he had a fellowship with uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, that that relationship was going to be a picture of a New Testament truth. Nor did David know that when he was to be set up as king of Israel that his kingdom would be a kingdom that would last forever, that Jesus Christ himself, a descendant through Mary of David's family line, would produce Jesus Christ who would sit on the throne of David. David wrote all those things, had no idea. He's the one that wrote Psalms 22 that we look every uh, Easter time at is the description of Jesus Christ's suffering. All these prophets in the Old Testament, they wrote all these verses because now where we sit, we can look back and see the symbolism and we can see the truth. We assume they all saw it too, but they didn't. And that's the reason, your favorite verse, Stephanie, is when they, after Jesus was crucified, after he died and buried, after he rose from the grave, the first question they ask him, are you going to set up the kingdom now? Acts chapter 1 verse 6. So they just, they did not understand it. So even though that, that phrase sounds real religious and real biblical and everything, it has no biblical basis to it at all, that the Old Testament looked forward to the cross and the New Testament looked back to the cross. The truth of the matter is, in Genesis, God's design for this world had nothing to do with the cross. Not that it was not important, but his goal, purpose in Genesis chapter 1 was to set up a kingdom, a kingdom on this earth. And we looked at that in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God said, here's, here's the deal. I'm going to give you dominion over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and the earth. Gave him dominion. It was not until the fall of Genesis chapter 3 that they lost that dominion. And we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 later that when referring to Satan, they called him the God of this world and in another place, the prince of this world. And so the dominion that God intended for man to have, establishing a kingdom, uh, crumbled because of sin sin of Eve and then Adam and the kingdom went to the God of this world or Satan he was the king of the kingdom you remember how effective that was when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness and Satan said to, took him up to a pinnacle and said see all the kingdoms of the world I'll give them to you if you bow down he had them because of sin and so we trace down through uh, reading through the Bible, uh, all the um, events that occurred, it really wasn't until in Abraham, uh, in Genesis chapter 12, that God once again tried to, to bring together the kingdom through Abraham to this world. And we trace the ancestry of Abraham down <clears throat> to a person called Terah, who had a son whose name was Noah. And we did that because in that period of time from Abraham to Noah, the world had multiplied enormously. And with it came the sin that had crushed it back in Genesis chapter 3. And God had to wipe the whole thing out in a flood, and he saved only eight. Which is interesting, numerically, eight's the number of new beginnings. 
And so they came out of the ark, the eight, uh, to begin anew. And God gave the kingdom to Noah, which he took and through his three boys, we see that kingdom divided all through the uh, land. And unfortunately, uh, as they multiplied out, and we see those three boys, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, go every which direction, we begin to see the development of these kingdoms. And God chose, because of his foreknowledge, first Peter chapter 2 verse 1 or chapter 1 verse 2 his foreknowledge chose Seth of the three boys Japheth, Ham, Sheth chose Seth and through Seth he established his kingdom through Jacob and the twelve tribes and called them to be a nation where he would set up a kingdom they did very well through the years of the judges and then through uh, uh, David and Solomon and then we read through the kings how those things just deteriorated because of sin to nothing. Finally in BC 606 2 uh, Kings chapter 24 verses 10 through 17 God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and utterly destroy utterly destroy the nation of Israel and decimate them. Uh, I mean, destroyed every building, carried away everybody captive, left only the poor and the destitute in the land, uh, cut up all the uh, instruments and the, the uh, serving dishes of the house of God in the tabernacle, just utterly dis destroyed it. And even though Moses, who was a great leader in his time, and was given the opportunity to establish this kingdom. You remember he went down to Egypt and he said, I'm, God told me to take you out of Egypt to establish this kingdom. Even though in his day, long before all this king stuff happened, he wrote in a prophetic song that God had asked him to, to write in Deuteronomy chapter 34. He wrote this song about the destruction that would come to God's kingdom, the nation of Israel. And he wrote that it was going to be utterly destroyed in this uh, song. But at the end of the song, he talked about this redemption that would take place of the nation of Israel. And he identified that person who would redeem Israel by the phrase, a prophet like unto me. So the one that was going to redeem Israel was going to be a person that was like Moses. And what do we know about Moses? Well, he's a prophet, and he had to prove his authenticity by signs. Remember, he took the staff and threw it down the ground, all those things that happened in that Egypt. And so he was surrounded by signs and wonders, and... That was his certification to prove. And so God says, I'm going to raise up a person in the future, even though I'm going to allow Nebuchadnezzar to utterly destroy the kingdom. I'm going to raise up someone in the future, like unto Moses, who will redeem it. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes in, he destroys the nation of Israel, carries away captives to Babylon, and it was a pitiful, sorry sad thing. I often think of America, that kind of thing, and just the hearts of people. Uh, if you've ever read in the Old Testament, uh, one of them says, sing, sing me one of your songs. They were in Babylon. And they said, how can we sing the Lord's songs in a strange land? How sad that must have been to think, you know, what they had known, with the glories of what they had known, are now gone. And so God says he's going to redeem that kingdom through a person likened to Moses, a prophet likened to Moses. Well, the battle and the defeat of Israel began the time period called in God's word the times of the Gentiles. Now, I'm giving all this background to everybody, and some of you have already had this, but I'm giving this background to those that are with us online as well as uh, those who are new to our Sunday school uh, here 
to understand the importance of separating the kingdoms that most people combine together. That's the whole idea of the principle is discrimination. Do not bring together what God has separated. And those two kingdoms I gave you last week so that you didn't have to wonder to the end is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Often confused because the kingdom of heaven, we use the word heaven and immediately everybody starts thinking up. And yet in Genesis chapter 1, where we begin the study of the kingdom, he talks about the heaven of where the birds fly, the earth and where the birds fly. And so the kingdom of heaven is not out there. The kingdom of heaven is here on this earth. And that's what God began to set up back in Genesis chapter 1, this kingdom on earth called the kingdom of heaven. Now, Israel battled and then was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar there in 2 Kings, it records for us. And they begin prophetically in the Bible what's called the period in God's time chart of the times of the Gentiles. And this is really important. So you had the Jews, a kingdom, and now you're going to see this other kingdom. The Jews lose their kingdom and at the time of the Gentiles take it over. While there had been prominent Gentiles prior to that date, Egypt, Assyria, Greece, Rome, etc., when God's people, whom he had given the rights of the kingdom through Abraham, fell into idolatry, they were subsequently carried away uh, unto captivity into Babylon, and God permitted the world power to pass unto King Nebuchadnezzar in that date, B.C. 607. The specific period of time referred to this is found in Luke, and in Luke it talks about the uh, specifically the times of the Gentiles in Luke. Now, it's also referred to us by detail or description in Daniel chapter 2, and uh, we won't go back there, but I, uh, for those of you who are taking notes or those who would like to know this, Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 45 and specifically those between verse 31 and 35. And this is the dream. Many of you are here. We've described it many times. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about this big image. And it's made out of all different types of materials. And has a head, body, everything. And then it comes down to the legs. And then it has ten toes. And in that dream... Uh, uh, notice in verse 36 and 37, it talks about kings of kings, and the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom. And so it's important that, to understand that God had transferred the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar's reign, although we won't take it into, we won't go into detail right now, uh, uh, is a total, that, that image is a total of four different kingdoms. Four different kingdoms, and uh, prophetically they speak of the time of the Gentiles through four different kingdoms. In his dream, Daniel saw five kingdoms. The Babylonian kingdom, which occurred and began in 606 B.C., the Medo-Persian kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, and the Roman kingdom, which towards the end of the Roman uh, reign is divided uh, but united into ten kingdoms. We might call them the United Nations. All right, And you find that in Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 through 43. The last kingdom, the fifth kingdom, is called the Stone Kingdom. And in, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 through verse 45, um, the Stone Kingdom is described as this stone falling down off of a mountain and rolling down the mountain and hitting those ten toes and absolutely destroying them. And it's very important to read that so that you can see that. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 through 45. Now, historically, this prophecy could have been fulfilled leading into the birth of Christ. Uh, we are not going to go into the details at this time, but just give me the benefit of your doubt and your curiosity. 
The birth of Jesus is critical because of the reference to the name of the last kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the Stone Kingdom. All right. Uh, the reason that this is so important is notice what we see in Rome. Uh, excuse me, Acts chapter four. Acts chapter four. And beginning in verse number 10. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 10. Notice what it says. Be it known unto you all... And you understand the, what's going on here is the Peter and his apostles, they're all trying to do the work of God. And uh, he's talking and he says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of who? Israel. That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now look at verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught, or rejected, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Speaking of Jesus as the stone, turn back to Matthew chapter number 22, excuse me, chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, and notice this again in, beginning in verse 42. Matthew 21, and look at verse 42 through verse 45. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And so he is speaking, Jesus, to the nation of Israel, identifying himself as being that stone that was spoken of in Daniel's prophecy, that when it came, it would roll down off the hill and it would absolutely decimate those ten toes. And those ten toes represent ten kingdoms the kingdoms that God gave the kingdom to, the dominion to, because the Jews rejected him. And so here we have this stone that will bring judgment by way of destruction. This specific judgment is referred to as the day of the Lord in the Bible. And that phrase, day of the Lord, is an important phrase. There's another phrase, the day of Christ, not the same phrase, uh, even though Christ is the Lord, uh, there are two different periods of time. But the day of the Lord refers to God's judgment that is yet future to come upon this earth. If you think about it from the standpoint of the earth or the world had their day on Calvary. They took Jesus and they beat him and they crucified him. And they had their way. What did they say? His blood be upon us and our children forever. So the world had their day. And there is another day coming. And it's when God's going to have his day. The day of the Lord. They poured their wrath out on Jesus. He's going to pour his wrath out on them. So the day of the Lord often referred to, though it's not totally 100% inclusive or restrictive just to, would be the tribulation period. Often in a generic form, we say the day of the Lord refers to God's judgment, which is the uh, judgment of the tribulation. And so the purpose of this day of the Lord, this time of judgment, when the stone will roll off of the top of the hill and dis destroy the Gentile dominion, that period of time that we read about the day of the Lord is specifically for the purpose of recapturing the kingdom. So, 
so that you all know what I'm saying, we make it a little bit more practical. Let's say, Keith, we're playing King of the Mountain. All right? And uh, Stephanie was on top of the... No, maybe I shouldn't say it. Uh, she was on top of the mountain first, and you beat her. And now you're on top of the mountain. All right? You're Nebuchadnezzar. You're the Ten Kingdoms. All right? And Jesus comes on the scene and sees you there. In prophetic terms, he is the stone that's going to bring in this new kingdom, the stone kingdom. And he comes and he approaches you as the ten nations, and he absolutely destroys you from on top of that pinnacle of that hill, king of the mountain, right? And he becomes the king. That will take place at the end of the tribulation period. And so here we have this pictured in the Old Testament through this image that Daniel had. We have Jesus speaking of that when he came to the earth as being the stone that the builders rejected. Peter, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in Acts chapter 4, speaks to the nation of Israel, again referencing that stone that the builders rejected and that God had made him that stone. And yet in all of that, they rejected Jesus. So Jesus was going to introduce this kingdom back. They were going to take it by force, take the ten, tri uh, ten nations of Daniel's dream by force. And yet when he came on the scene, they didn't see that part. When Jesus came on the scene, he didn't have a club in one hand and sword in the other. And when he came... Although he had all the signs and all the wonders of the prophet like unto Moses, he did not come with this big club in his hand. In fact, when he was inquired by his disciples about Rome and its dominion, remember the last kingdom was Rome and it had two legs and it divided into ten nations, the image. Rome was in power when Jesus came on the scene and he didn't have a club to, to destroy that. In fact, when they questioned Jesus about that, he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and the things that are of God unto God. And that they just, that blew their mind. How could Jesus be the fulfillment of this stone kingdom if he had that attitude? And so as we look at this, we're immediately perplexed at and understand why the Jews rejected Jesus because they were looking for something entirely different. Now, the reason that they were looking for something entirely different is because in B.C. 6, the angel of God, do you remember what the angel said? Look at uh, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 31. Gabriel is speaking to Mary, and he says in verse 31, Luke chapter 1, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the son of the what? Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the what? Throne. See, there's the dominion. There's the kingdom. The throne of his father David. And he shall what? Reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his what? Kingdom. There shall be no end. All right? So this is a very important passage of scriptures. When Jesus came on the scene, the, the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that he was going to be the stone. He was the one that was going to be the stone. After he was born, who was it that came from the east? It was wise men, we're, said, we're told. Notice Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came what? Wise men. Where did they come from? The East. Now this is interesting. And uh, 
it, it's such a wonderful study. We did go in great depth of this. I don't want to do that to bore everybody, but it is important for those who are just now getting this um, uh, concept in our online study and here in our classroom, is that when Nebuchadnezzar came in and decimated and removed the kingdom from Israel in 606 B.C., he carried captives. He took people away, the smart ones and the bright ones. And we overlook that sometimes when we're reading the book of Daniel, is that Daniel was not just a righteous person, but righteousness to him was more than just what he did. It was his life. Do you remember what the first contest was in uh, Daniel chapter 1? The first contest was for him to eat the king's meat. So the king wanted Nebuchadnezzar, wanted to fatten these uh, uh, people that he had carried away captive, wanted to fatten them up. And Daniel says, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. What an important verse. Here's a guy that escapes with the skin of his chinny chin chin, okay, from the destruction that just occurred in his homeland, probably saw many of his relatives brutally murdered. And then is marched all the way across the Middle East to Babylon from Jerusalem. And gets there as a captive, and the first thing they want to do is wash him, clean him up, and fatten him up. Many of us, if we had escaped what he escaped from in Jerusalem, we'd said, whew, I made it. But making it to him was not a life of ease on this earth. Making it to him was to honor his God. And so he says, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. And he had gained favor with the king's counselors, <clears throat> but they were scared they would die too. And so he proposed to them to give them a short period of time of them eating pulse. Oh, that's disgusting. Uh, eating pulse, all right. And after a period of time, if they didn't look better than everybody else, then they would, they, they would eat the king's meat. Of course, after the period of time you know, they excelled among those people who had been eating the king's meat. And so no one was the wiser except for the Chamberlain and uh, Daniel. But at any rate, they were inv involved in the affairs of King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And what occurred is that David, because of his wisdom, was carried away from Jerusalem. And because of his wisdom, was put with the wise men of Babylonia, of Babylon. And in the midst of all that, king has a dream and can't understand the dream and when the, all the wise men can't tell him what the dream was he was going to destroy them all among them would be Daniel and he would absolutely destroy them and so word finally gets to Daniel about what the king's going to do and he petitions the king to give him time to pray and seek God's face and then he comes to the king and he tells him the dream and then tells him the interpretation. You see, all the wise, other wise men wanted him to tell the dream and then he would, they would interpret it. You know, we've got a lot of those kind of people around today, you know. They want to make you think that they know something, but they don't know anything. They don't even know the dream. Then they're going to make something up sound really fascinating afterwards. But David told the king the dream and then the interpretation of the dream. And so you remember what King Nebuchadnezzar did after that? He made the, Daniel the head of all the wise men of Babylon. That is the reason in Matthew chapter 2 that it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east. These were generations of wise men from Daniel Daniel, who had instructed the wise men about the things of God in that strange land, and now generations later, these wise men from the east, the Babylon area, put together through the writings of the prophets of God in the Old Testament, 
not only when this prophet like unto Moses was coming, but where this prophet like unto Moses was going to be born. And so they said, verse 2, these wise men, where is he that is born, what? King of the Jews. You know why you need a king? Because you have a kingdom. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And so these wise men were the, that came looking for Jesus in Matthew 2 were generational descendants whose parents served with Daniel. And Daniel had such an impact upon their life and an influence on their life that they, even though they were not followers of God, they became followers of the ancient writings of God so they could pinpoint the time and the place when this prophet like unto Moses, who would be king over the Jews, would be born. What a fascinating, fascinating story of how God did this. All again to make sure that we understand God's primary focus on this earth from Genesis 1 to the end is to establish a kingdom on this earth. It is to establish a kingdom. And he's doing this a literal, visible, physical kingdom starting in Genesis 1 with Adam and Eve and trying to get it established all the way through till finally, through all the failures, what's he do? He's his only son, the stone king, to establish this kingdom. In fact, this is bore out when we examine the ministry of Jesus himself. We're going to stop here today, but as we look at the commands, not only of Jesus' disciples, but of Jesus, all of the parables, all the Beatitudes, even the prayer that we normally and commonly refer to as the Lord's Prayer, all of them are about that kingdom. Jesus' entire ministry was directed towards this kingdom of heaven on this earth. And that's the reason, according to your favorite verse, after the crucifixion, which went clear over the top of their head. I mean, how in the world can someone miss someone being brutally beaten, hung on a cross, put in a grave, go check out the grave, and it's gone. It's empty. And then you see him. And some doubt, and he says, touch and see flesh and blood and and they touch him and they see him and they finally come together for this last grand finale and even in spite of all that they say will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel Acts chapter 1 verse 6 there is no question at all that God's main focus on this earth was to establish a literal kingdom on this earth called the kingdom of heaven where the birds fly and the earth. Yep. All right. So next week we'll pick that up. We're going to sh we're going to look at Jesus's life and his ministry. We're going to document that this was what his purpose and his intent was. And then after that, we're going to see what happened when he tried to bring in the kingdom what they did to him. Well, we already know, right? Amen. But we want to see it as we look through the Bible. Well, hopefully, uh, I didn't go too fast for those online. I know some folks here, you've already been through it. Others, it's kind of new. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. If, you, if I did, submit a question. We'll answer it on Wednesday night uh, and uh, be able to deal with it there. Uh, we are up to 26 questions that have been submitted for Wednesday night's discussion. That's a real blessing. And so if you have a question, uh, behind me is the uh, email address, John Young First Baptist at gmail.com. Send your question there, or you can drop it off at the uh, office, slip it underneath my office door if you want it to be anonymous. Uh, but uh, we have an, a lot of questions. They're very good questions that came in. I take it back, we have 27, because someone sent me a question just last night. And uh, so uh, submit your questions, we'll go through it. And especially about this kingdom, this is so important. If, if there, this is one of the major um, major principles in the Bible that is overlooked to the peril 
of Christians in their life for Jesus Christ. They blend two kingdoms together that God intended to be separate. And we'll talk more about that next week. Thanks so much for joining us online. We're going to start here again in the morning service in about 20 minutes. And if you're just getting up, uh, you miss Sunday school, but you still have time to get to church. Amen. Uh, we're glad that you joined us this morning. For those that are overseas, thanks so much for joining us. I hope that you'll come back for the morning service as well. God bless you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that we have today. Thank you for the truth of your word and the spirit of God in us that bears witness to the truth. Help us, Lord, I pray, to know this so that we can understand the things that you made different instead of trying to make them one and the same. And we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great day.